Ready? Good morning, everyone, and welcome uh, to this very important conversation with the Honorable Judge uh, Jonathan Lippman, Chair of the Lippman Commission. The topic is the closing of Rikers Island. Where are we now? Let me also uh, say thank you to our co-sponsors. We have the New York Board of Rabbis, uh, more just NYC, the Interfaith Center of New York, Freedom Agenda, Jewish Coalition on Criminal Justice Reform, Bronx Connect, and Trinity Church Wall Street. A brief thought before uh, we start our conversation. In Jewish tradition, it's interesting that if you look at the Talmud, which is a examination uh, of the Torah, so it's the oral law looking at the written law, it begins on page two. There is no page one. And I think that's a message that uh, we need to fully integrate into our lives. There are people for whom page one was taken away and they have to begin on page two. And I think that's our responsibility. You know, when you're born, you begin, but you also have to learn sometimes in life how to begin again. So hopefully we all working together. And it was Bishop Michael Curry who said, when we say all, we should mean all. And I think this conversation demonstrates that our faith communities, all of our faith communities can come together and bring that dignity and decency uh, to those who are incarcerated and to those who work uh, in our prison system. So it will be a better place for all. And when the incarcerated are freed, they can begin again. Thank you so much. I now wanna call upon um, our first presenter, and that is uh, Darren Mack, co-director of Freedom Agenda. Darren? Thank you so much, Rabbi Joseph, and thank you everyone for joining us this morning. So Freedom Agenda is a member-led organization dedicated to organizing people and communities directly impacted by incarceration to achieve decarceration and system transformation. We are leading the grassroots work to close the last penal colony in the U.S., Rikers Island. We launched in October 2020. However, although Freedom Agenda is, is new, our staff and members have been engaged in the movement to close Rikers for years. And the discussion and attempt to close Rikers goes back decades. One example, there were efforts in the past made by the late and great Herb Sturz, who was the, the deputy mayor for criminal justice in the Koch administration in the late 1970s. But those efforts, that effort was met with vitriol, fear mongering, and reactionary punishment paradigm backlash and obviously defeated. That was a top-down effort. But in 2016, a bottom-up grassroots movement of survivors of Rikers Island, their families mm -hmm. and allies built a coalition that was so broad that it changed the hearts and minds of New Yorkers to understand that Rikers Island was beyond reform and it's beyond repair. And the only solution for the last penal colony in the US is closure. So through our advocacy and organizing, we pushed the city to adapt a plan to close all 10 jails on Rikers, including the boat, which is adjacent to the Bronx, and address conditions of confinement by replacing the decrepit, deteriorating jails in Manhattan, Brooklyn, Queens, and a facility in the Bronx. So that's going from 14 jails all across our city down to just four. From 14,000 beds down to a max population of 3,300. And city council passed this plan in 2019. Freedom Agenda has, we picked up the baton and this year, after years of organizing and advocacy, criminal justice and environmental justice organizations collaborated and advocated and pushed for the Renewable Rikers Act, which is a trio of legislation, um, which was passed by city council, a law with, that establishes a process to transfer control of Rikers Island from the Department of Corrections to the Department of Citywide Administrative Services for sustainability and resiliency purposes as the jails close. 
And for the first time in Rikers almost 100 year history, land was transferred and a facility was transferred in June. A law, also a law that required New York City to determine the feasibility of what renewable energy and large scale battery storage can be cited on Rikers Island as a part of the long term energy plan and also a law that required New York City to access the capacity for organics and wastewater processing on Rikers Island. But we cannot get to renewable Rikers until we close Rikers. And in order for us to remove the, the moral stain of Rikers on our city, we need to, the city to move forward with these plans. For more, and for more information about our, our work, you can go to our website at fa.urbanjustice.org and I'll end by saying as the great novelist, uh, philosopher, and journalist Fyodor Dostoevsky, he wrote that the degree of civilization in a society can be judged by entering its, its prisons. And I echo that and say that the degree of civilization in our city can be judged by entering our jails. And I want to thank everyone this morning and thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Darren. I will now turn to uh, Judge Jonathan Lipman. And Judge, I want you to know that uh, not long ago, I wrote a recommendation for someone that I would see his services on a regular basis. And the person who received the recommendation from me called me and said, you know, you wrote a very glowing recommendation there, but I know you see this person on the Sabbath. What does he do the rest of the week? How does he behave there? Uh, and I've been privileged to know you for many years on the bench, off the bench. Uh, and you know, Judge, there is a prayer that we recite in our daily liturgy, which says, give us judges as they were when they first began, uh, when they were first admitted, people who are committed to their principles of life throughout their career. And I can honestly say in knowing you and recommending you uh, that you are one of those special individuals. Uh, I was uh, thinking the other day, growing up in New England, you would see a uh, house of worship contiguous to a, a courthouse. And when I asked, you know, why is that, you know, configuration uh, the way it is, the answer was because what you say in one place, you have to see in the other. And throughout your distinguished career, uh, I think many of the principles that we pronounced in the house of worship, you also enacted in the court of law. So it's a great honor to have you with us and we look forward to your remarks. On the closing of Rikers, where are we? Well, thank you, Rabbi, and thank you for the lovely introduction. It's been a delight to know you so well for so many years and uh, to be involved in any uh, undertaking with you is, I know, a good one. And so I'm so delighted to be here today. And where are we? Well, you know, we're in an emergency situation, Rikers. Um, the, it truly is dire, uh, a threat to the lives of people who are incarcerated there and the people who work there. Um, you go in, you don't know when you come out, if, if you're going to come out, you know, on any given day. And that applies again to the corrections officer who work there as well as uh, the people who are held there and the families who come to visit. 14 people like locked up at city jails have died in the past 11 months, and at least six apparently by suicide. Uh, the problems at Rikers are not new, but COVID has obviously deepened the, the crisis that we face there. For decades, the city underinvested in Rikers, and it created a situation that was really out of sight and out of mind for most New Yorkers. A lawless environment was allowed to develop with far too little accountability for the awful treatment and working conditions people had to endure there. Violence has long been rampant. In fact, we've had a federal monitor overseeing Rikers uh, for more than five, five years now. But the violence is worse than ever. The jail buildings are a disaster. Uh, Rikers is actually made up of eight active jails. They are built pri primarily on decaying landfill. Uh, Rikers is a place where New York City for so many years used to dump much of its uh, uh, garbage. And as the landfill decays, 
sewage lines and water pipes break, the foundations crack, uh, met methane fumes rise up and people get sick. Uh, the jails are freezing in the summer and sweltering, uh, freezing in the winter and sweltering in the summer. There are spread, they are sprawling jails filled with poor sight lines, meaning the officers who are there cannot easily see what is happening, hence the violence that you get. Hundreds of cell doors don't lock properly and money, many others can be broken open relatively easily. The current uh, crisis is exacerbated by the fact that there have been deep staffing shortages, uh, again, compounding these longstanding problems. Every day, nearly 30% of the correction officers on, at Rikers are unavailable to work. Uh, and you know, you have to ask, how did we get there? How could we be in this situation today? To begin with, um, it's a dangerous job and often thankless from day one. When COVID hit, the Department of Corrections, to be fair, did a poor job providing staff with personal protective equipment. Um, that's the fact. Hundreds of officers got sick, over a dozen died, an already deepening inhospitable place got even worse. The union's contract provides for unlimited sick leave and some take advantage of that. Um, those officers are turning up at work, often are forced to work double or even triple shifts, meaning 16 or 24 hours at a time. There's not even anyone around to relieve the officer so they can call home and say that they're not coming home because they have to work a double or a triple shift, causing havoc of people's lives. When faced with this process, prospect, even more staff have called in sick. And, you know, it really has created a terrible problem. It's understandable. And yet this is their job. And the city is depending on them. We're all depending on them. So uh, as a result of all of this, even with the mandatory overtime, even with double and triple shifts, some housing units in the jails go hours or even days without an officer inside. Some of the deaths in custody have been linked to these uh, staff shortages. For in, in instance, a young man named Robert Jackson was discovered dead on the, in his cell at Rikers. And he was discovered there 15 hours after the last officer on a shift left and went home. And why did that happen? If that officer had worked 20 hours straight, but no one came to relieve him, even after he called several times asking for someone to take over. This, this staffing short, these staffing shortages have terrible, serious consequences. Um, incarcerated people need a correction officer to escort them everywhere in this antiquated physical structure. But with far too few staff on duty at any time, there's often no one there to take people to the medical appointments, to go get a shower for a family visit, for a religious service. People miss court dates, which is the worst thing possible. Is then they stay in Rikers longer, waiting for their correct uh, uh, court uh, uh, date. In fact, over 1,600 people have been in Rikers for over a year, waiting for trial, and 700 have been waiting for more than two years. This was not the original design. People are supposed to be held there. This is a jail, not a prison. This is held there pre-trial for short periods of time. Um, meanwhile, weapons have proliferated at Rikers. Most of them are manufactured, believe it or not, from the rusty deteriorating pieces of the buildings themselves, metal and plexiglass broken off and crafted into shanks. With too few officers around, people feel increasingly vulnerable. And this leads to an arms race of the worst possible kind. I mean, this is an incredible situation. The, um, because there aren't enough staff, you can't do the usual searches that might come up with these weapons to find them. Um, this is just leads to violence every single day. The current commissioner of the Department of Corrections, Vinnie Giraldi, 
is a terrific guy who's been a, a jail reformer for many years, but he needs all our support to get the job done. Um, and he agrees that the only real answer is to close this miserable, horrible place that's an affront to humanity. Have we made progress today? Yeah, we have. Um, we've made some massive progress. Until COVID stroke, uh, struck, we were bringing down crime and incarceration at the same time. When we started our work as a commission in 2016, there were 10,000 people locked up in Rikers. There are only 5,500 there now. That's progress. This was the continuation of a real fantastic trend over three decades. In the early 1900s, 1990s, there were 2,200 murders in New York City each year, and over 20,000 people locked up at Rikers. In New by 2019, we had brought those numbers down by roughly 75%. That's a real accomplishment. But then came COVID, and shootings and killings rose in New York City. Some have been quick to blame jail reform more generally for this for this being the case. That's not the facts. Uh, uh, month and month out, month in and month out before jail reform, uh, before bail reform and after bail reform, less than 1% of all people in the community released pending a criminal case have been rearrested for a violent felony. The New York Post did a survey of the numbers from last summer and it found that out of everyone arrested for the 528 shootings that took place through June of 2020, only one person had been released by, by virtue of bail reform. That's one out of 528 shootings. So, you know, the bottom line is crime is not just a New York City problem. COVID has caused a rise in crime and in murders around the country. I mean, the real common thread to all of this is COVID. Uh, and that truth may not win out but three decades of experience in New York tell us that the decarceration, limiting the number of people in jails, justice reform and safety are all mutually reinforcing. Closing Rikers is a key part of returning our city to that path. And there is a plan to close Rikers. Um, there really is. We work very, very hard on a plan that's been approved by the city um, to close Rikers safely and securely. In fact, closing Rikers is now the law in New York. The jails have to legally be shut down by August of 2027. This was the product of a hard fought advocacy campaign by so many impacted people like Darren, who you heard from today, with a push from our commission and faith leaders like all of you. Um, the mayor de Blasio agreed in 2017 to close Rikers and replace it with four much smaller, safer, state-of-the-art jails in the boroughs. The new jails will be much closer to courthouses and to our communities. People will be able to get to court so that cases can be resolved. Lawyers, social workers, and service providers will be able to get to the jails much more easily to prepare people's cases. Critically, family uh, members can visit more easily. Right now, family members can visit for an hour. It takes them hours and hours to get to write this. In 2019, the city council endorsed the plan and committed to building the four new jails, form a new local jail. They passed legislation that again, made that 2027 deadline mandatory. A part of the plan, a key part of the plan, is to continue to bring down the jail population. And we can safely do that, safely decarcerate. Safely is really our touchstone here. Um, none of this is worth it if we can't be safe in our communities and in the jails. Uh, and I know that was our, it's a paramount consideration in the commission. And I know it's the same with all our allies in this effort. Safe decarceration has, decarceration has two prongs, crime prevention and smart decisions once a crime is committed 
to hold people accountable and do everything we can so that they never commit a crime again. That means we need to rely on community-based solutions more and less jail. Jail is sometimes necessary. People who are gonna hurt other people who commit acts of violence do have to be taken off our streets and incapacitated for some period of time. But we want to limit the use of jail to people who absolutely need to be there. And if they do have to be there, they have to be treated decently. So jail remains a key tool for safety. At the same time, the overuse of jail actually makes things worse. The, our studies show that people who go into jail, even briefly, are often traumatized and come out and go on to lead a life of crime. So more crime in the future, more people being hurt. That, of course, doesn't mean that people should not be held accountable for wrongdoing. No one wants anarchy. Uh, what it means is that we can do better without subjecting people to the dangerous, deeply destabilizing environment at Rikers. This is especially true for people who are homeless and who have sort of serious mental illness. Too often they cycle in and out of police stations, not getting the help they need until something really bad happens. We need to end that cycle. In July, with our partners at the Center for Court Innovation, our commission stepped back and looked at who, who ends up at Rikers and why, and laid out a roadmap for bringing that population down. And it will take all of us to get this done, but we will all benefit when we achieve it. First, who is it, Rikers? Let's take a look at that. There are 55, give or take 5,500 people there. The vast majority of the people, 92% are held for pretrial. That means they're there for a brief period until their cases are heard. 88% of the incarcerated people are Black or Latinx. 84% of the staff are also Black or Latinx. 17% of the jail population has serious mental illnesses. 49% have some form of mental illness, including 84% of the women. 74% are charged with a violent felony which does not always include violence due to the vagaries of New York law. But by and large, people there at Rikers are facing serious charges. Thanks to bail reform, uh, the, the jails are no longer clogged up with people held on petty drug offenses, turnstile jumping, prostitution, or shoplifting. Remember, you accused of one of those relatively minor crimes, you go into Rikers, and you come out as a career criminal. This is, that was not productive. But the bottom line is, um, for the people who are still there, um, they're there for, for, for crimes that are meaningful, serious crimes, and the cases have to be just, uh, uh, um, resolved. And any study or, or, or look at the decarceration is taking account the kinds of numbers they just went over the, with you. So how do you safely decarcerate? Given these realities, and again, with safety paramount, let me, let, paramount, let me give you two examples of how we can lower our jail population and keep it down while increasing public safety. You know, the courts have been hit hard by the pandemic. They, they, they were, had to hold up on trials because of the, the, uh, uh, the, the COVID itself. And then when they renew trials, they have to keep people six feet apart in the courthouse, which means that on any given trial, they need two or three or four courtrooms to hold one trial. So that doesn't make sense. So we're looking at, we should be looking at, maybe just like with kids in the schools uh, who've been vaccinated, maybe you can reduce that uh, uh, space between people to three feet and allow trials to move more quickly so that people can get in and out of the criminal justice system when they need to and not be tied up waiting and waiting for the wheels of justice to grind. Just getting back to pre-COVID timeline will reduce the jail population 
by 800 people or almost 15%. Second, let's work to get people with serious mental illnesses out of these places like Rikers. This doesn't give them the help that they need. People with serious illness, mental illness, again, make up 70% of the jail population. That's almost a thousand people. We need supportive housing for those people before they even get arrested. For people who are arrested, we need more community-based inpatient and outpatient treatment options that judges can send people to. Because there are too few right now, so judges have the choice of either sending people to Rikers or who maybe you know, need medical help or effectively doing nothing. Nobody wins in that calculation. Finally, there are three empty and underused state prisons in Manhattan. They could be turned over to the city, you could use them for the mentally ill or for women who need a standalone facility. They, you know, they're being transferred out of uh, Rosie at Rikers, and, but, but where they're going is, is not a great place either, uh, Bedford Hills in Westchester County. Um, we need to have more facilities in the city where we can send again mentally ill people and have a separate facility for, for women and uh, um, transferring some of these unused facilities to the city will be very helpful in that regard. And the borough-based jails, they're on track for 26 or 27, 2026 or seven. The existing jails in Queens, Brooklyn and Manhattan will be torn down and modern, safer, smaller, economy of scales, jail, uh, jails built on those grounds, and a new uh, jail will be built on the site of a tow pound facility in the Bronx. In the next few weeks, contracts will be signed for the demolition and site prep work. Then the contracts will be put out uh, to bid for the jail construction. Um, we have to treat this like the absolute emergency that it is. Every day, people are spending time on Rikers Island. Their lives are at risk. We need the actual work on the jails to get going in the next few months. We need the speed that this crisis requires. This is a terrible, terrible crisis. These borough-based jails will not be cheap, but we will easily recoup the cost, an annual operating assignment, a savings, and then some and then some more over the years. Today, our city spends over $2.6 billion per year for the disaster of Rikers. That's over $450,000 per incarcerated person per year. When the borough jails are built, we can save almost $2 billion of that money through improved operations and reduced staffing needs. Um, you're gonna have a net saving of $1.5 billion per year, even after we pay for the new jail. Imagine the good we can do with that money. Reform cannot stop though with the physical plant. We also need to change how the Department of Corrections operates so staff feel supported and are also held accountable when they, when they commit misconduct. This starts with leadership, again, Commissioner Giraldi is doing a strong job, but he needs help. For instance, our city should be able to hire uniformed supervisors, wardens, and captains from outside the state rather than be limited to hiring them from the corrections department. We can do better. The law needs to be changed to provide more flexibility to run our jails the way they need to be run with safety, with efficiency, with humanity. Uh, and, and let me close by talking about our new mayor, Eric Adams. The responsibility for all of this will be on his uh, uh, watch as the new mayor. And I know him for many years. I've talked to him about this issue for many years. He is a strong supporter of closing Rikers and building these new locally based safer jails. He may, he may want to tweak the jail plan, such as shrinking the size of some of the jails, uh, by, for instance, in Queens, Queens, by moving women to one of the closed estate facilities that, that should be transferred to the city. 
But he knows that the reasonable path to closing Rikers is by building replacements in the borough. You can't do it without doing that. And by diverting people from jail to alternatives that we know work to prevent recidivism and to boost the chance, chances of individual success. That will improve safety. At the same time, Eric Adams, and I know this firsthand, is passionate about cutting the pipeline to Rikers. Smart community investments have been essential in making New York safer and people's lives better over the past few decades. I'm excited by all of the new possibilities with the new administration coming in and continuing that trend. He will need all of our support and occasionally perhaps our prodding, but he is up for the task. He is committed to doing it. And we need together in the name of public safety and racial equity and justice to work together to close this horrible, miserable place forever forever and ever. Rikers is an accelerator of human misery and must be closed and must be closed at the earliest possible time. Every day, lives are at risk. So that, that's where we are with Rikers. I'm so pleased to have all of you today to, to get this update on the crisis that we face. It is a crisis. And I look forward to any discussions or questions among all of us who are available uh, to continue this this uh, a, a real dialogue on Rikers and and all of the again all the, the tremendous problems we face today, Judge Libman, let me uh, say thank you to you first of all for this very comprehensive presentation. It, it was illuminating. Uh, let me say thank you again for arranging that visit uh, of faith leaders to Rikers. We often say that hearing doesn't compare to seeing, and when we saw those conditions in human conditions. I think it reinforced our need to collaborate. And I think you're seeing today the cooperation of the faith community. We have an example here uh, of true partnerships. So uh, you've been a great leader and we uh, really are grateful to you uh, for the uh, inspiration and the insights that you have provided to us. Reverend Chloe Breyer. My, my pleasure. Thank you. Reverend Chloe Breyer is uh, executive director of the Interfaith Center and a, a real friend. And we have worked together on a host of issues and uh, look forward now to her participation. Rob, Reverend Breyer. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Potasnik. And thank you, Judge Littman, for um, an extraordinary overview. And I think um, it is uh, now my job to um, referee some of the, the questions that have already um, come up from uh, different uh, spaces both uh, before the um, webinar began, there were some good questions that were submitted to us, and um, and during your um, during your your talk as well, and um, and so we are embracing this opportunity both to ask you questions, also um, Darren and uh, any anybody else whose uh, whose face you see on this on this panel, I suppose. I want to begin with. Um, with uh, Luke, Lucas Pershing from um, Trinity Wall Street. Lucas, you had a, a question regarding the mayor, which follows on quite nicely from what Judge Lippman said. Yes, thank you, Reverend Breyer, and thank you, uh, Judge Lippman and Darren and everybody else, Rabbi Potasnik. Um, wondering, this question is for the judge and uh, for Darren. Can you talk a little bit about some of the decision points that our current mayor, Mayor de Blasio, has over the next few months in office and what Eric Adams, what he needs to do to keep things on track and on time, and even you know to expedite things. Uh, what are what should the faith community be watching for? And you mentioned prodding Eric Adams potentially if we need to. What are the things that the faith community should be watching for? Specific steps that that should be taken over the next few months to make sure everything continues on track. Let me let me start, and then Darren can jump in. Um, Obviously, keeping the borough-based uh, jails on track is tremendously important. You know, we talk about it and contracts are being let it. To me, nothing is meaningful till we see uh, um, stakes in the ground, to see shovels in the ground. That's how we know something's going to be happen happening. They have to be built fast 
And we will be, have been, and will be emphasizing with the new mayor that get those shovels in the ground. Um, second, I think what we can do now, or what the new mayor can do, is make sure people with mental illnesses are diverted from Rikers. Um, and, and again, uh, uh, that can be done with the cooperation of the state. Um, get facilities for those people they shouldn't be in the jails. The city also promised that 300 supportive housing beds would be in place. They promised that in 2019, yet not a penny has been granted towards that effort. That has to change. And uh, Mayor Adams can change that. Uh, he, I, he also has a great idea about converting empty hotels into permanent supportive housing. That's something that should be done. And again, securing, expanding the number of secure hospital beds available for people with mental illness um, so that they aren't sent to Rikers. He's got to speed that up and we have to help him to do that. So again, I think it's a cooperation um, with Governor Hochul and we have to be pushing on the state level too. But Aaron, uh, uh, Mayor Adams could come in uh, um, on a roll. He knows the issues. Well, I personally have talked to him many times about it. And, and I think that it's up to all of us to let him know, be supportive as he does these things at the extent they don't get done, push, push, push. So Darren, I think you would agree with all of that, right? Absolutely. I echo everything that the judge said. The only thing I will add to that is, you know, decarceration is a must right now. The mayor could actually right now expand what um, the, what's known as a 6A program for early release for people who are sentenced to city year sentences, you know, for a year or less. Um, the mayor can also move forward with land that the Co Renewable Rikers Coalition had a, has identified that's not being in use by the Department of Corrections and transfer that land before his administration ends, um, sending a signal to the next administration that the closure of Rikers Island is moving forward. And, and lastly, the mayor could also continue to work with the governor, as the judge has mentioned, to transfer those state um, prisons over to the city so we can ex um, utilize it, renovate it, and utilize it for as a single lo um, site location for women and mental health, like the judge has mentioned as well. And I would just reinforce the last thing Darrell said. It's not just it's not just the mayor. He is the principal player, but the governor can be so helpful together. So I think as a community, the faith community should focus on both of those key uh, uh, instruments to get something done. So that is, um, yeah, we want to also acknowledge that um, there have been some questions which you've really addressed about uh, the, the new mayor and, and what are some of the points uh, which we should look out for. It sounds like those shovels in the ground or the hands that signed the contract. Um, we've got to keep our eyes out for that because there's certainly once one gets into office, there are plenty of pressures. So we as faith leaders can keep our eyes on that. I want to also acknowledge the... Um, uh, we've got um, Reverend uh, Sharon White Harrigan here from um, the uh, Beyond Rosies campaign, and I'm hoping that she might um, be able to give us an update. Uh, as you know, the governor recently announced the closing of Rose, the Rose M. Singer Center um, and the transfer of many of the women to Bedford Hills. We're just wondering, um, Reverend Sharon, if you'd be able to say a moment, like, what is the the long-term hope for these, um, for the women being um, transferred out of the Rose M. Rose M. Singer Center. Uh, thank you so much, Reverend Kaloli. Um, and thank you for having me. Um, the Beyond Rosie's campaign, let me just say, is a campaign under the Women's Community Justice Association, also known as WCJA. And so the long-term hope is that the governor, that Governor Hochul will um, use one of the downstate facilities, turn it over to the city, and that way it can be repurposed as a, a wellness center, a healing center for the women in the community. Um, as it stands right now, 
the women is slated to be the last to leave under the plan, under de Blasio's plan um, to be moved in 2027 in Queens, which shares a footprint and a platform with the men's jail in, in Kew Gardens. And so, you know, our hope, and again, I just, I, I just want to say that, no, the women being transferred to Westchester might not be the ideal thing, but it's the first time we saw any official movement for the women, you know, for the women to be highlighted. They are the lowest population, you know, and I just, I have to say this, you know, I, I just don't have a reverend title. You know, I am a woman with lived experience. I've been on Rikers Island. I spent over a decade in Bedford Hills Correctional Facility and no lockup is ideal. However, there are some, some pros to this where the women can be with their families seven hours on a visit versus the one hour on Rikers Island. The travel to Bedford Hills actually is shorter than it would be trying to get through on Rikers Island to go see your loved one. And although, you know, we're not, we're not uplifting or praising, you know, Bedford Hills correctional facility, but the the one thing that we, we do want to stress is that this is a window of opportunity that can be used to get the women decarcerated in, in a meaningful way. This is a window that we haven't had before. The Beyond Rosie's campaign has existed almost as long as the Close Rikers campaign. And as much ground that we have gained on this campaign that people have supported, and we thank you for the support, nothing happened with the women. Nothing. And it took Governor Hochul to highlight the women. And so this is an opportunity right now. Why? Because everybody in every platform, in every forum is now talking about the women. Something that has not happened before. So yes, the long term is to get the women in the community, get them into community alternatives, get them back with their loved ones where they belong. But in the interim, we needed this jolt. And that's exactly what happened. Everyone was jolted. Thank you so much. Are there any comments from um, anybody in reflecting <clears throat> on? Let me just add um, one thing to that. And obviously, the Reverend Sharon is exact, everything she said is exactly right. Um, you know, most of the women who go into these uh, horrible places like, like Rosie's um, are not violent. Half, overwhelmingly, most of these women didn't have to be in jail at all. And going towards that ultimate goal, that looking at people, looking at the problems they have, a number of them have a mental medical problems that need to be addressed. And jail is such a, a poor vehicle for most of these, these women. And I think what it highlights, and the Reverend Chan is exactly right in focusing on women. And, and what we also have to do is look at each of the different populations at Rikers and in our jails and give them what they need give them the support of the services that they need rather than just taking everyone with a broad brush, throwing them into jail and then figuring out what in the world to do with them. So with women particularly, so many of them don't need to be incarcerated in the first place. And I think that's the ultimate goal. But as, as the Reverend says, in the interim, let's deal with what we have and make it as, as supportive and, and uh, um, fulfilling for the women who are there, I mean, get them the help that they need, get them out of there. I mean, it's, you know, so I think looking at our different populations is very important, starting with the women. And can I just add one other piece is that mm -hmm. I know that a lot of people 
um, think it's unconstitutional to have women who are detained up in, you know, a state prison. But I also, you know, want to say and just put out to the community, it's unconstitutional to also have women detained on a toxic, toxic wasteland for three and four years. Because if you go into Rikers Island and you speak to the women, you will realize that more than not, women have been there for three and four years with their case unresolved. That is also unconstitutional. Thank you, Reverend Sharon. Thank you so much. I wanna turn, we've had a few questions also about um, renewable Rikers. And uh, you know, is the next mayor um, any indications that he is in support of uh, of that that additional step? And I think perhaps we ought to, for those on the call who don't know what renewable Rikers is, maybe we could um, outline that first and then um, speculate a bit about the mayor's response to it. Yeah, let me let me just start on that. Uh, we took a really heavy look at the commission and what should be done, assuming you could close uh, Rikers, what could be done with the island? And you know, these are, this is a rare 400 plus acre parcel of city owned land development. And right away, we, um, we came to some basic conclusions. Um, one, that because of its proximity, because of its proximity to LaGuardia Airport, we recognize that um, you couldn't put housing there. You couldn't house people there. Um, it's on, again, landfill. It's close to LaGuardia. That didn't make any sense. So really what we came to the conclusion was that Rikers ought to contribute, the closing of Rikers Island jails ought to contribute to the greening of New York. And that's where you get this renewable, renewable Rikers uh, uh, idea and nomenclature that that let's do green infrastructure. Let's take the um, let's take things that are that are on city land in the boroughs that could be help could help in the environment in New York City and put those on Rikers solar panels, composting, sewage treatment plants. And that's really what the Renewable Rikers uh, legislation sets up. It sets up committees to take a look at that. It, um, it really puts us in the middle of efforts to free the boroughs from a lot of these uh, um, kind of uh, eyesores that on Rikers would be a perform a service for the city. And then you could get commercial, uh, residential, uh, development in the boroughs. So that's what Renewable Rikers is all about, setting up commissions to look at it, uh, uh, to decide what's the best use of it. Um, and that's, that's what it's all about. And anyone who supports, as Adam says, just to get back to your question, anyone who supports closing Rikers and building the new facilities also supports Renewable Rikers. Thank you, Darren, did you want to add to that or add anything? No. no I just summed it up beautifully. Okay. I just, I just shared the Renewable Records website um, in the chat for folks to, if they want more information on it. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much for doing that. Um, and then there, this, is, this is a question that has really come up a lot. Um, you know, you live in, in uh, the Bronx or you live in Manhattan. And someone is proposing that um, down the road from you that they is a um, brand new jail um, proposed. And you think, gosh, I'm not sure I want a brand new jail in my backyard. Um, what, what do you say to, uh, and they're, it's inclusive of a few faith leaders, I'm afraid to say, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so how do you deal with the question of, of the sort of the not in my backyard? Let, let, me, let me start that one off too, because we dealt with the NIMBY effect, not in my backyard, um, that really as we, look, when we started to do this, the advocates, the commission, so many of us, when we looked at this, people thought it was impossible. Why? Because jails 
are unpopular. People don't want jails there, then they think it'll hurt their property values. They think there'll be crime there. So that was one of the things that we studied. And we came to the conclusion that that's just diametrically totally wrong. First of all, modern jail construction is very different than these horrible old jails that you have. Uh, they have commercial development on the bottom level. Um, they're not eyesores, they have light, they have air, not only for the good of the people who are incarcerated there, but for the good of the community. And we also did look at property values and crime in those areas and look at, for instance, um, the, the Brooklyn jail facility now. That's the hottest real estate market in the city surrounding the Brooklyn jail. And so it hasn't done any harm to that community. And the studies show that crime rates do not go up because there's a jail in the area. And, uh, and certainly property values, as witnessed by, by Brooklyn, is just an example, can go way up. So I think it's a false <laughs> argument. It's, I don't begrudge it. I understand that's a natural reaction. But if you look at the modern jails and how they fit into communities, I think there's a very different reaction which one can get if you really look at the, the studies about it and look at places around the country where this has been the case. Thank you so much for that. Um, we have a question also from um, Rabbi Barat Elman, um, just about how these four, again, on the topic of the four borough jails, um, you know, I think one can often wonder, you know, are we just shifting the problematic dynamic that existed in, in Rikers to another, you know, cleaner facility? How do we know that, what are the practices that will change? Yeah. Um, well, well yeah. my view is, first of all, in and of themselves, Rikers is an archaic structure. You can't continue to have a jail there. That you can't see anything around the corner that dangerous. It's, it's archaic. It's the opposite of modern uh, 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 jail construction, you know, without, with, without question. But I think the point is, if all you're going to do is build local again, safer, uh, everything about them, uh, more decent jails, that's not enough. What you also have to do is change the culture that produced Rikers. And that's why in the commission's report, we advocated strongly for a new changing fa uh, training facility for people to work in these places and also to change the whole conception about what a correction officer or a person who works on Rikers does. The goal of, of, of Rikers is not to punish people. The goal of jail should not be punish and hurt people. That's not what this is about, help people. And if you look at places that have done this around the world and around the country, it can be done much better. We went to places, places in other countries that are a whole different view of what a correction officer or what a person who works at one of these jails should be doing. They should be helping people to get a new life. It doesn't mean that you don't pay your debt to, uh, 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 to the community for doing something wrong. But if we're gonna continue to view the jail and the way that we view, view Rikers, that's a terrible mistake. You can't just, as you say, uh, Reverend Chloe, you can't just take Rikers and put it locally and think that's the end of it. You have to change the culture. You have to generally change the viewpoint of what incarceration is for. We have time for maybe, I think, one or two more questions. Um, I've been struck by um, uh, early on, um, Amy Glitman asked the question to you, Judge Glitman, um, please advise how the faith community and clergy can best help the Close Rikers campaign. Are policy recommendations useful or should the faith communities stick to a call to conscience? And that's not just for this issue. That's a deep question, I think, about where is where are the faith communities um, efforts best spent in terms of a general kind of call to conscience or do we how nitty gritty do we get in terms of some of these policy asks? 
Well, well, you know, my view is that, and, and you know, I've said this to, to Rabbi Joe so many times, that you bring a lot to the table. When we were trying to get Rikers closed and get the city council and all of that, having the faith community behind this was so instrumental to have uh, Rabbi Joe goes that we did in front of the Supreme Court Courthouse in Manhattan to have the uh, Cardinal Cook and the uh, and the, the the Reverend and the uh, the uh, Mother Islam leadership and all of the different the Reverend Bernard and all the different uh, uh, um, uh, faith leaders to uh, uh, to come to the table to be visible is so important, you know, so important. And, uh, you know, I, I think that I wouldn't underestimate that. Does that mean that anyone has a monopoly on poly good policy ideas and that we can't use them, whether they come from the faith uh, community or, or, or any place else? Um, you know, of course we can use, yeah, of course you can dig into policy, but I think you you bring something that nobody else has, and that's that that moral conscience, that higher higher ground. Uh, and I think you've been instrumental so far. And I think the visibility that you bring, and again, if there are good policy ideas to boot that come along with it, that's great. But the visibility of you pressing for the closing of the Rikers of Rikers to building smaller more humane jails, that you bring that to the table, that's terrific. And that's, that's, that's so much uh, uh, on day one. And then anything else is all gravy, my view. And then um, Darren and Reverend Sharon, can, can you, um, we don't wanna let you off the hook with this question too, given that you've both been involved um, intimately with this issue, where, where do you believe that, um, faith leaders at this point in time can weigh in um, most effectively? Yeah, I would say um, one, like not only with this administ administration, but the next incoming administration, you know, acts, you know, directly for specific policy ask around the issue, you know, we're moving forward with the closure of Rikers, we're moving forward with renewable Rikers. And also to add to that, um, in 2019, along with city council voting for um, the closure of Rikers Island and the borough based plan, they also um, passed legislation um, to establish a commission on investments in communities impacted by Rikers. That commission has been convening this year. That commission is required to submit budget uh, investment recommendations to the city, which by law, the mayor is required to respond to in 60 days. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm one of the uh, members of this commission and other um, survivors of Rikers and di different stakeholders um, and city agencies are part of this commission. And it will be um, great if once this is published that faith leaders push and pull the next administration to actually take these recommendations seriously and institute these recommendations. So that's something that's gonna be published hopefully next month. And the, the mayor will have 60 days to respond to those recommendations. So those are the things that faith communities could do um, with the current administration coming coming, coming soon. Thank and you I, so much. And I would, I'm sorry. And, okay. and I would say that, you know, the world was built on the institution of religion and faith. And so there's this strength and, and where two and three are gathered in his name. And so I, I just think that it's a moral um, responsibility for us, us as faith leaders. We have our parishioners, we have our congregation also put, you know, speak to them about this so that they are informed as well, right? So that we can gather because it's very important to uplift the community. And that's what the community leans on their faith leader, right? Um, and so I think that all that Judge Lippman said, all that Darren said, 
and I'm just going to add to also include your congregation. Let people, you know, when you know better, we do better. And when people are informed, then there's less fear and they trust us, right? As their leader, they trust us. And when we mobilize, you know, when faith comes together, when the faith leaders come together, you know that nothing is impossible, you know? And, and I just think that we just need to remember who, where, who and where our strength come from. It comes from the Lord. And that as long as we lead with that, this here, when we fight, we win. And that's what we need to remember as faith leaders when we mobilize. We fight, we win, because we have a higher power on our side. I, I agree. Right, well, I'm not the, the, let me just say the vision of all of you together is so impressive. You can't imagine when you see each one of these different faiths. And Rabbi, Rabbi you, you'll tell God, uh, Cardinal Dolan, uh, that I forgive me for calling him Cardinal Cook. Um, you know, <laughs> old. Old habits uh, uh, don't die easily. Yeah, I but, forgive uh, you. Right. Yeah, thank, thank you. Right. I, hopefully he will, but- I give you, well, I give you a dispensation. All right. And I think yes, after but, our stirring words, we should have a collection. Yeah, but all of you together can make such a difference. I think that's the point. All right. Well, I want to thank you so much to everybody who wrote qu questions in the chat. Um, we had so many good ones, um, and I'm sorry that not all of them were addressed, but um, I think we've made good progress here. Uh, this this um, will be available, this recording. We hope that you will share it. And I'm going to just say that we do have a, a suggested action step here. Um, if I can figure out how to share my screen. Um, I should be able to share that action step. Have Rabbi Diana help. She's very good at this. Wait, Rabbi Gerson, let's see. Reverend, Reverend Brian needs help. Oh, but look at that. Can everyone see it? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, so this is a, a, our suggestion for, um, you know, for a way to kind of, again, educate co your congregation to, um, sign on to a campaign that can then um, help you know where we are in terms of this campaign. We, we need each other in order to move this forward. So I encourage you to sign on to the um, Close Rikers Island campaign and to share this with other faith leaders. So um, I, uh, I hope that we, we, the Interfaith Center, have done that and we encourage you to as well because we're going to have to keep our eyes on um, on where this goes as we transition as a city to a new uh, leadership. So thank and you. And the Beyond Rosie's campaign for the women. Yes, as well, right. exactly. Please put that in the chat if you wouldn't mind, Reverend Sharon. Um, Rabbi right. Potasnik. Thank you so much, Reverend Brian. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we cannot thank you enough, really, for taking the time to be on this call, but also for your longstanding commitment to addressing the issue uh, Judge Lippman, uh, you're more than a friend. You, you are my rabbi in many ways. Uh, and I have been with you, never in front of you as a defendant, but I have been with you uh, many times uh, over the years. And let me just tell all of you one simple story that occurred to me when I first became a rabbi. Uh, it was in Brooklyn, Congregation Mount Sinai. And I was chaplain of the Federal Prison of New York. And we had arranged a program where if you were concluding your sentence, uh, you were allowed to go to services uh, for the High Holy Days. It so happened during that time, someone in the congregation was stricken with a heart attack. And the person who administered the aid and saved the congregant's life was someone who was in the federal prison, a nurse who had got into trouble uh, and was responsible for uh, that person continuing to live. And the person acknowledged him so many times. Um, so when we say, from whence will my help come, you never know. Uh, and I think it's a message to all of us. Don't write anybody off. Don't discard people. Learn to treat everyone inside prison, outside prison, uh, that they deserve uh, to be respected and to uh, help in a humane fashion. And then maybe from the darkness, we'll see the dawn of a new day. Thank you all very much. 
Thank you.